بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم دي فيوز ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of Live in London with our dear guest Dr. Sayyid Ammar Naqshawani We will continue to discuss certain topics in regards to the Ahl al-Bayt and tonight we will be concentrating on the life and the legacy of Fatima al-Zahra Peace and blessings be upon her Sayyidina, let's kickstart the program with uh, a question around the theme of Fatimiyah. I want to understand, how do you see, how have we taken religion and evolved it around Fatima Zahra? Have we put enough emphasis on Fatima Zahra in our religion? I think in the Muslim world there can be a bit more emphasis on the role of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, I think. The very fact that she is mentioned as one of the four women of heaven or one of the four women of paradise highlights to us the stature mm. that this lady was held in the religion of Islam, especially in the nascent period, in that early period where you're looking for personalities mm. who are role models for us. There is no doubt that you don't need to look any further than the Lady of Light and when she's placed alongside, if not above, the likes of Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh, mm. Maryam, the mother of Christ, Khadija, peace be upon her. When she's placed alongside these great women and then is even known to be greater than all of these women, according to the traditions of the Prophet and mm. his family, this gives us an indication that there is a need for us to dissect who Fatima is. Mm. Much of the discussions of Fatima al-Zahra in our communities revolve around her being the daughter of the Prophet, so she must be great. Mm. Peace be upon him and his family. Or her being the wife of Imam Ali salam, so she must be great. But that's just greatness by association. We don't really look at her life and how she is great Exactly. Herself, yeah. We want to know what is it that made her reach that level. Mm. Where the Prophet, peace be upon his family, stresses she's a part of me. Whoever angers her, angers me. Whoever pleases her, pleases me. And so I think within our communities, especially in the world today, where even Muslim and non-Muslim women are looking for that person who's able to balance their family life, mm -hmm. able to balance their spirituality, able to balance their uh, communal time and service mm. back towards society at large, I think more and more emphasis needs to be placed on Fatima al-Zahra salam and on the many facets of her character. Fatima the wife, Fatima mm. the mother, Fatima the lady involved in interfaith dialogue, mm. Fatima the lady who sees the first days of the trials and tribulations of the religion of Islam, Fatima who is involved in the world of politics. I think a lot of the myths that we have built as Muslims are shattered by the Islam of Fatima al mm. Look at the difference between Muslims and Islam. We as Muslims have built our communities in a way where there's a particular Fatima al-Zahra we want to take and a lot of a Fatima al-Zahra we want to ignore. Pick and choose. So mm. we've literally picked and chosen which of Fatima Zahra we feel maybe relates to our worldview mm. and is not necessarily what she envisaged. Yeah. Mm. But you did mention earlier as well that we usually see Fatima Zahra, peace and blessings be upon her, as a wife or as a daughter. But how important was that relationship between her and Rasulullah? It's an, it's an amazing relationship. And it's one which is to be seen as being even more important because she grows in a period which is extremely difficult for him. Mm. Remember, she is <coughs> in reality and her lineage until mm. today is a gift given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and his family when the Holy Prophet kept on being called Abtar. Mm. We know that the word Abtar, what does it mean? Abtar means when a tail of an animal is cut, they mm. used to say that that animal is Abtar. And because the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, 
because his children died at a young age, you would find that some of the people, how would they mock him? They would keep saying whenever he'd walk past them, Abta, Abta. Saying he has no lineage. No lineage. Mm. Now, when someone keeps insulting you with that insult, it's difficult. Why? One of the most difficult circumstances in the life of any human being is either a miscarried child or a child who was born but dies upon mm. or on the period of their birth or a child that may die in infancy. It's a very difficult time, especially for the mother. So that father walks around Mecca and has this group of people headed by Al As bin Wa'il. And you've got others around of the aristocrats of Mecca who keep insulting him by calling him Abtar and Abtar. And what's interesting is that this isn't the only insult that he's receiving at the time. When this insult is leveled at him, one of the ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers him. Mm. Or answers them as well is by saying, Inna kal kothar. We have given you an abundance. They're saying that your lineage is cut because your boys have died. I'll tell you what, we'll break all of their stereotypes and prejudices. We're going to make your lineage continue through a woman, through, a woman. Mm. through your daughter. Until today, you will see the great grandchildren of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Only her from the daughters of Rasulullah. When people keep mentioning Zainab and Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum and they're like, why do people only mention Fatima? Why don't they mention the other daughters mm. of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family? Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, Allah blessed her that she's the only daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, lives after him and has a lineage that continues until today. If you look at the royal family, for example, of Morocco, they are from the Descendants of Fatima Zahra. Mm. If you look at the royal family of Jordan, because sometimes our community assume that only the Shia can be called Sayyids, for mm. example, or only the Shia are to be known as the descendants <coughs> of the Ahl al Bayt. Salam. Whereas you find in Morocco, in Jordan, in different parts of the world, there are descendants of the Ahl al Bayt salam, from the lineage of. Mm. Fatima al Zahra. I believe they call them Sharifs. If I'm not Some mistaken. in Morocco, yes. Mm. There are people who are called Sharifs. Mm. Um, notably, those who, for example, may have been from the, uh, from the grandchildren of Imam al Hassan. Okay. Mm. Uh, but then, of course, this can extend also to Sharifs, not from the line of Imam al Hassan. So, what you have is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He said, Inna a'tainaka al kawthar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies, to those who are insulting the Prophet. Now, who is the medium who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses as the reply? And that's Fatima al Zahra. Oh, Zahra. But Allah. then, as the Prophet slowly begins to spread the message further and tell more people about the religion of Islam, the insults continue to increase. And really, his source of solace is Khadija and his daughter Fatima. Mm. If you look at the ayah in the Quran, for example, the famous ayah, Have you seen the one who insults our servant while he's well, in his prayer? prayer yeah. They used to throw the feces of an animal on the head of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And I ask you, who was it that used to wash that feces away from his head? Who was it that used to clean up after him? Who was it that when his uncle Abu Lahab and his wife used to put the firewood in front of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. Who was it that would ensure that that firewood would be removed so the Prophet doesn't trip over it? Many people don't realize that Fatima Zahra salam in the first 10, 12 years, in the first, one would argue, in the first six, seven years of her life in particular, faced the most difficult period any daughter could ever face. Mm. Her father's being insulted. You know very well if your father now was being insulted by a member of the community. It hurts you. Of course. It hurts anyone if their father, for example, is insulted by a member of their community. And you have here with Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, her father is insulted regularly. She sees her mother go through a period of starvation. She was only a couple of years old at the time. Her mother and the Shaib of Abu Talib. Mm. You know, sometimes we complain in our life. We, we say things like, you know what, our life's too difficult. 
you know, the, the flat or the house or the condo that we live in is not as great as we can have it. Mm. Many people don't realize that the, the, the lady who turned out to be the greatest lady in Islamic history was a lady who in the first couple of years of her life was living under economic sanctions. Mm. Like some people of Iraq have lived under economic sanctions. Like some people, for example, of, you know, other countries in the Middle East have lived under economic sanctions. This lady, couple of years of age, she lives under economic sanctions. Then, her mother Khadija dies. Yeah, we, we never hear anyone talk about her relationship with her mother Khadija. We always hear the relationship between Rasulullah and Khadija and Rasulullah and Fatima Zahra. But we never actually hear, not on the minbar, not anywhere in fact, about the relationship of Fatima Zahra with Khadija. How was that relationship? How did she take the death of her mother? It, it's, it's extremely difficult that the moment when she realizes that her mother's died, remember she's only five years of mm. age. And you can't wish that on anybody at that age to see their mother die. And the narrations show us these exchanges between her and the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family, where she realizes that, you know what, I've lost my mother. There is a thought in the back of her head, any daughter would want her mother with her on her wedding day. Mm. Her mother has died. But I think more wonderfully, she sees her mother in the middle of a patriarchal, arrogant male society very confidently stand up for her rights as a woman. Today, there are many different forms of feminism that you see which have emerged. And each and every one of them, in one way or the other, seeks to either bring justice in the battle between <clears throat> the sexes, or seeks to bring a sense of equality, or seeks to recognize the rights of the woman of that society and how these rights, if they are trampled on, mm. there needs to be people who speak out. And I think with her mother, if you look at one of the biggest influences in her life, it's her mother. Because with her mother, her mother not only is able to balance a household, being married to the Prophet, peace be upon his mm. family, she's also able to manage a business. And she's also got this altruism which affects Fatima Zahra a lot in her life, what we call in Arabic ithar. Mm. Ithar is a great, probably the greatest form of generosity in Islamic ethics. You know, sometimes if you talk of someone generous in Islam, you say they are Karim or they are Jawad or they mm. are Sakhi. But altruism, the person who is known for their ithar, for their altruism, she learns this from her mother, Khadija, because the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family says in the famous narration that Islam would not have <coughs> spread were it not for the wealth of Khadija and the sword of Imam Ali, alayhi salam. Mm. And so what happens is in those early years with her mother, she forms a bond and a friendship and she looks at the sacrifices that her mother has given for that religion. The Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, the year that his wife dies. I think if it's not for the likes of Fatima Zahra السلام, being in his life. Because remember later, he says she's the mother of her father. Mm, um, Abiha. Now a mother, what is she? A mother is a source of warmth for us. A mother is a source of compassion for us. A mother is a source of generosity for us. A mother is a source of empathy for us. Many of us with our mothers, when we're down, we look towards our mothers. When you're looking for a smile, you just look at your mother. When you want to talk to someone, you know your mother will always be there. Sometimes your mother doesn't even do anything and you notice the sacrifice mm. in her. And so the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, when he says that she's the mother of her father, in a way one may argue that those early years in Mecca, with Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam's death and with Abu Talib, in the same year. Alayhi salam's death in the same year which the Holy Prophet refers to as the year of grief. grief. Mm -hmm. I think that at that moment, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, you know when you're young and you face tribulations, you mature much quicker. Of course. You know, you'll see, I remember Abel Fadl al-Abbas's wife, Lubaba. Lubaba, the wife of Abel Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, saw her brothers assassinated in front of her when she was young. And I think later on, what keeps her strong in the midst of all the difficulties 
is that at a young age she has seen trials. Mm. Fatima Tizara alayhi salam at the age of two is living in the valley of Abu Talib with economic sanctions. At the age of five becomes an orphan. Mm. And I think that's why in our lives whenever we go through issues of anxiety, issues of mental health, issues of depression. I think that's the beauty of how Iman can be one of the helpers for us. <coughs> because Iman, what does it do? Iman provides you with that lesson and that belief that there are others who've come before you who face tests like the ones you're facing, including Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. One may think that why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need to test Fatima Zahra? Fatima Zahra would never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't really think of it why? from the angle, yeah. But sometimes Imam al-Baqir says, alayhi salam, when Allah loves his servant, he drowns them in the sea of suffering. When Allah loves Allah. his servant, it sounds paradoxical. Mm. When Allah loves his servant, he drowns them where? In the sea of suffering. It's as if sometimes, if you want to know if you're a real believer. You see how, how much you're tested. How much you're tested. Mm. And you look at the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, and it's the embodiment of the ayah of the Holy Quran. But then Allah will at the end say, So I think her mother provides not only an unbelievable example for Muslim women in the world today, but I think the daughter that sees her mother on an everyday basis, that has a major influence on her life. Yeah. Knowing that the relationship between Fatima and Zahra and her parents was so close, when Rasulullah went on the hijrah from Mecca to Medina, he left Fatima and Zahra behind. What was Imam Ali's role in that situation? Well, I think it's the first time that there is a, a sudden spark between the two, mm. which inevitably leads to their marriage a few years later. But there is a spark because she notices the, the bravery of her husband to be. Of course, they get married um, a couple of years after this incident. But she notices the bravery of her husband mm. to be on that night, the night of the migration of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, from Mecca to Medina. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, migrates from Mecca to Medina because he realizes that patience is the better course than raising a sword at of this course. time. Now, someone could easily say, that's a sign that he's a coward. I'm saying this because we're going to come to this later when Imam Ali is accused of the same okay, thing. Yeah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, his family mm. could have easily raised the sword against Walid ibn al-Mughira, Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, Utbah bin Rabi'ah and the likes. But no, he decides, you know what? Let's be patient. There's bigger things coming. And there is a wisdom there, mm. that me fighting them is not going to solve anything. Or rather, it could destroy my message. He migrates from Mecca to Medina and teaches us a second lesson. That Allah's land is vast enough for all of us. When you're not finding success in a certain area, don't stick there. God will open other doors for you. You know, sometimes a person, when you ask them, why are you not religious? They say, you know, the area I live is not a religious area. If I lived in Karbala, or I lived in Najaf, or I lived in Qom, or I lived in Mashhad, or Qahira, or Medina, I would be religious. But I think we all realize that even in those areas, you'll find characters who you'll realize aren't exactly God's gift for religion. Really, if you're in a certain area where you feel that <coughs> you're not establishing in your life the tenets of the religion of Islam and following the the code of conduct of the religion, then Allah shows you even with your holy prophet, peace be upon his family, that my land is vast enough. Go somewhere else. Mm. Even tabligh. You know, as uh, muballigh, you may be reciting, for example, uh, poetry in your area. You're not achieving success. Travel elsewhere and recite that poetry. You may be reciting Quran in your area, but no one takes the notice of you. Recite Quran recite elsewhere. You may be lecturing mm. in your area. People don't take notice of you. Lecture elsewhere. Number three, when he migrates as well, he realizes that maybe if I'm not flourishing here, I'll migrate towards the land of Medina. There's grave danger on his life. There's many different tribes who want to stab him that night. 
And he asks Imam Ali alayhi salam to sleep in his bed that night. Famous narration in Sunni and Shia tradition that Imam Ali sleeps in his bed that night. And when they come to remove the cover of the bed, they see Imam Ali alayhi salam there. And it's not like Imam Ali is in a state of grief. You know, there's no need for God to reveal a verse saying, La tahzan. Mm. Not at all. On the contrary. If I die, I die on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gladly took that place. Gladly. Mm. There's no issues there. God doesn't need to reveal a verse saying, do not grieve. Nor does he need to rem remind him that Allah is with him. On the contrary. Mm. There are those who sell their soul for the pleasure of Allah. You won't find them grieving at any moment or in any difficulty. Willing to sacrifice themselves in any scenario. Any scenario. Mm. They're never scared that what will happen if this person finds out that I'm in this position. Mm. What if they're going to kill us? No, not at all. If you guys have the guts, fight me. My name is Ali, son of Abu Talib. And until the day that's, he that's died, enough. only yeah. a coward struck him while he's in his prostration. Now, when he manages to get out of that situation, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, has given him a couple of tasks. The first task that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, has given him is some of our enemies have left behind some of their trusts with me. Mm. This is a very ironic sentence. Some of our enemies have done what? Have left behind their trusts with me. When it says our enemies have left behind the trust with me, you'd think, hold on a minute. Why would an enemy leave your, his trust with you? The enemy used to hate the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, but he used to recognize him with one thing. He's definitely Sadat. You got, and he you is Amin. Yeah. Mm. He is truthful with his tongue, but he is trustworthy when it comes to possessions. And so what you have is, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, has told him that there are some of these guys, you're going to have to return the deposits or the trust back. But the second role that you have, there are three Fatimas I want you to bring with you. First of them, Fatima bint Asad, your mother. Second of them, Fatima is Zahra, alayhi salam. Third of them, Fatima, daughter of his cousin or his uncle. When he tells him that you must look after them, imagine this is a very sensitive moment, but she witnesses that of all those who claim devotion to my father and to the religion of Allah, none is like the son of Abu Talib. And at that age, how old was he? 23. He was 23 at the time. And I always say to people, ask yourself, what were you doing? And how much had you given back to the service of your Lord in your early 20s, the way Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, gave his whole life and his youth for the religion of Islam? Like, you're not surprised when you hear, mm. La fata illa Ali. Ali. There is no youth. Don't ever discuss youth except if you mention Ali. And so what then happens is that he takes them from Mecca to Medina, not an easy journey. People imagine that, you know what, they just went on an easy journey, they managed to escape. It was not an easy journey at all. Extremely difficult journey, but they managed to get to Medina. And it gave Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi so much pleasure. Not that he only saw his daughter Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam coming towards Medina, but that he saw Ali come towards Medina. You know when they done the brotherhood in Medina? Yeah between the Muhajirun and Ansar, between the uh, migrants and the helpers. Each of the companions, if you are a Muhajir, you take an Ansar as your brother. Mm. And when they asked Rasulullah, who's your brother? He said, Ali, son of Abu Talib. Imagine, could have easily been the same situation. We could have told Imam Ali alayhi salam that you have to go, for example, towards um, finding yourself a brother mm. or I'll find a brother for you. But no, on the contrary. You are my brother. And many times he would say, you are my brother in this world and the hereafter. So that hijra journey, that migration is, is fundamental in Islam because our calendar is, of course, based of course, on it. Whenever yeah. you mention an event, you always mention after hijra. But also, it's the first time one may argue that she's at an age where she appreciates the valor of the son of Abu Talib. And this was one of the main reasons he was considered to take Fatima Zahra or was it before that? Well, Shi'i traditions would always tell you that this was arranged in the heavens. Mm. But I think if you're looking within the general narrations of the religion of Islam, what happens is 
um, a number of people who come and propose, you know, and um, uh, Abu Bakr comes to propose, the narrations tell us, um, and Umar ibn al-Khattab comes to propose, and uh, Abd al-Rahman bin Awf comes to propose, mm -hmm. and these all have their standing within the Muslim community, and, um, and the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, you know, some Muslim fathers won't even tell their daughter there was a proposal. The father himself would just turn around and say, and... Oh, no, sorry, bye. Yeah. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, actually teaches us an ethical lesson. Someone comes with a proposal. You could tell your daughter, she says no, she says no. Even if she says yes, you can still give your advice, but pass the proposal on. Mm. I think sometimes there are girls in our community who were hard done by or mistreated, where there were good proposals for them, which their parents felt were bad. But which the girl may have said, no, on the contrary, I would have loved to have married this person. So I think what happens is that when you look at the traditions, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, he, he tells, he welcomes their, you know, their proposals. Imam Ali, السلام, at the time, if I'm not mistaken and my memory serves me correct, was staying in the house of Sa'ad bin Ma'ad. And Sa'ad bin Ma'ad, Amongst others, has a you know discussion with them. Why don't you propose for Fatima Zahra salam? And there's an unbelievable humility from Imam Ali salam. He doesn't say, "Well, you know who I am. I'm Ali ibn Abi Talib." This, this. No, he just turns around and says, "Well, am I worthy to talk to Rasulullah in such a way?" Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And also, I don't know if financially I have the capability to look after her. There's a number of lessons here. Firstly, that. He's looking to get married in his early 20s. Many times people ask me, when do you think the right age is to get married? And, and if you're looking at the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, or Imam Ali, you're looking at 23 to 25 years of age. But then everyone's circumstances differ. Then secondly, the fact that he thinks about his financial situation. <laughs> and I think that's something important, that sometimes you've got people who, well, my dad has money, so that should be enough for me. Sometimes you've got people who want to get married because their sexual desires are extremely mm. high, but they've forgotten that that comes with a lot of responsibility. Sometimes there are people who don't know how to manage their finances and get married. Imam Ali ibn Talib actually thinks about this, that you know what? Economically, can I look after the daughter of the Prophet mm. of Islam? Peace be upon him and his family. And, and what's amazing is how easy the Prophet Muhammad makes it and how difficult some father-in-laws make marriage today. Today, sadly, in the Muslim community, you have situations where father-in-law wants to see bank balances and wants to see, you know, uh, show me, for example, what car you drive, what house. And while security for one's daughter, I think, is fundamental, does that father remember how he was when he got married? Mm. And does he forget the Quran says, The Quran makes it clear that you marry of the single from amongst you. And if they are poor, Allah will look, make them rich. Doors will open. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase the rizq, the rizq of wealth, the rizq of health, the rizq of education, different forms of rizq. And so it comes towards the Holy Prophet, the proposal is taken. And the Holy Prophet does what he does with everybody else. And that is that he takes the proposal towards um, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. Now Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, Normally you'd find that she, there's a certain look in her face and that would indicate rejection. But this time the Prophet notices that her silence is her approval. And when it comes to the mahar, Imam Ali is very clear. Imam Ali doesn't beat around the bush and saying that, well, you know, my dad owned this, my uncle owned this. I'm looking no. for work. I'm, yeah. yeah, Imam says, no, on the contrary, I only have, a, if you want something for the mahar, I have a sword, I have a camel and I have a shield. That's all I own on this earth. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, says, as for your sword, keep it to defend the religion of Islam. And as for your camel, keep it. You can irrigate the land and earn an income. Doesn't matter that you're Imam Ali. Doesn't matter. No, you, mm. There's nothing wrong in earning an income. Mm. You're a Mawlana, you're a Sheikh, you're a Sayyid. There's no harm. You could be a cab driver on the side. You could work in a shop on the side. You could work in an office on the side. There's nothing wrong. There are 70 levels of worship. And the first of them is to earn a rightful or a lawful living. Mm -hmm. And then number three, he says, as for your shield, al-hadima, which was one of the booty of the battle of Badr, he says, sell that. Whatever it is, that will be the mahar of Fatima. 
Today in many of our communities, when we have a wedding, when the mahar is being recited, you hear the mahar of Fatima al-Zahra And that's on the basis of the mahar between Imam Ali mm. and Fatima al-Zahra salam. And, um, and you find that that relationship blossoms into the most wonderful of relationships. And it really is not as lavish a ceremony as you'd mm. think. You know, you'd think this is the daughter of, you know, God's final messenger. They're going to have a really lavish ceremony. It's not cheap. And it's not crazy. You know, mm. it's not a, you know, a cheap ceremony where you're like, mm, you know, they really haven't thought about making it a nice day. Nor have they gone into the millions and how much they've spent. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, asks Abu Bakr, Salman, Bilal, others. He tells them that here's a certain amount of money. Go buy some household goods for um, for the family. And they all go out. You need your you know, tablecloths, your tables, your mm. mats, your wood and this, your that. They go out and they have enough. And they prepare a meal and the community is invited. We have a walima in our communities today. The community is invited. People are welcome to join. So it wasn't a cheap affair, nor was it a crazy extravagant affair. But did Fatima Zahra herself not demand anything? Or they just left Rasulullah? No, she doesn't demand anything at all. On the contrary, I think, you know, th that famous tradition, if it wasn't for Ali, there's no uh, equal for Fatima in the sense that the only person who's above Fatima Zahra alayhi salam in the whole of, you know, whole of existence at the time is Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. She's mm. absolutely honored. There is a spiritual mahar that is spoken about in some traditions. Mm. You know, the, the intercession for her, Shia, for example, you know, that is a spiritual dowry that is associated with some members mm. of the Ahlul Bayt salam, and the tradition ends that no one will ever comprehend what is the position of Fatima mm. al-Zahra alayhi salam. But on the whole, no, there isn't really any demand for anything in particular. So would you say that spirituality that you just mentioned would you say that was one of the most important traits in that marriage? Or is there something else that teaches us lessons from that marriage that we can apply in our life today? I don't think you'll ever see a relationship where two people are thinking more about their community and looking after them than they think about themselves. Mm. You know, sometimes you could get married and completely distance yourself from the community. There are people who are so active in our communities the moment they got married, they just run away from the community. Or they start making excuses that, you know, the community is not active, the community is full of hypocrites, the community is this or that. No, you just got married and mm. that was it. That and, was it and, yeah. and I think I think what's beautiful about them, and she summarizes it in one sentence, Al Jar Thumma Dar. Mm. Your neighbors and then yourselves. Because when her children would see her recite dua, <clears throat> they would be amazed when she's reciting dua. Then why are you reciting for others first? And she'd say the community first, the neighbors first. The communal spirit would mean that Imam Ali would bring people home for dinners. You know, it's like if he noticed and, you know, his brother Ja'far al-Tayyar was the king of it. You know, Ja'far al-Tayyar, if he saw anyone hungry, he'd, he'd bring him home straight away. And Imam Ali alayhi salam, likewise. And you have verses in the Quran that highlight they would prefer to see someone not starve mm. and have their hunger looked after and see themselves starve mm. and see themselves put in difficulty and the eye of the quran that strikes me the most mm. they give away altruistically from themselves <laughs> even though it's going to bring them immense difficulty this ethar and Ali and Fatima, subhanAllah, it's in tandem with one another. Sometimes in marriages, you've got one side of the marriage, very communal, very wants to help, very, and the other side, no interest. Mm -hmm. And yet with Imam Ali and Fatima Zahra salam, you'll find on the contrary, they both have this yearning to look after the members of the community, to be there if any of them require difficulty. And you know that ayah, when the verse was revealed, mm. they had made a nidr or a mannat that, you know, Imam al Hassan and Imam Hussein were ill. And they had made this vow that if they recover from their illness, they'll fast for three days. 
Now, you know very well, when it comes to iftar time, we're starving. I'm the type of guy, like, I just, I, just, I just start, you know, just looking at that clock and hoping that it goes quicker. And, you know, I'd, I'd start losing my head at that moment. And, and what's beautiful about Imam Ali and Fadl Zahra is that they're at this point where they're about to break their fast. Someone knocks at the door. Needy person. They give their iftar. Miskeen. Next day, yatim, orphan knocks at the door. Give to the orphan. Next day, asir, captive. Don't know if he's a Muslim or non-Muslim. And that's the beauty as well. That when they would see someone who's in difficulty, they would not irrelevant. think, what is religion, you know, so. are they Muslim, are they non-Muslim? They have asked for help at that moment. We're going to be the first to provide them with that help. <laughs> when we do this, we do it what? For the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm. Do we want jaza? Do we want shukur? Do we want your thankfulness or your reward? Not at all. That altruism is unique. There is that line Imam al-Shafi'i mentions about Imam Ali in relation to this altruism in his marriage with Fatima Zahra. When he mentions, Ana ubaydun lifata unzila fihi hal ata. I'm a slave to a youth who the verses of hal ata were revealed upon him. You know, hal ata ala al-insani hainu min al-dahri is the beginning of that surah. Ila meta aktumu. Ila meta, ila meta. For how long do I conceal this love for this youth? Now, Imam al-Shafi'i is one of the biggest, you know, Imam of a school of fiqh, you know, al-Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali. Mm. But he says, I am a slave to a youth. Unzila fihi hal ata. Al-ayat ma'al hal ata. They were revealed about him. Ila meta aktum. Ila meta, ila meta. For how long am I going to conceal this love for I ha- that I have for Ali? Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam and Fatima Zahra their marriage, and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed them with an honor because of that sacrifice, mm. because of that altruism, when the ayat al-Tathir was revealed. Ayat al-Tathir was revealed in honor of the fact that these people are so selfless and sincere in every act that the lutf of Asma, the grace of Asma, was showered upon them. Asantum Sayyidina, there was a follow-up question, but inshallah we'll come to that straight after the break. I'd like to remind the dear viewers that they can call in for the second part of the show, inshallah, on 0203 You can call in, you can message us your questions, and inshallah, they will be answered. But for now, we'll go to the break and we'll be back with you very soon, inshallah. Welcome back, dear viewers, to the episode of this episode of Live in London, where we are discussing the life and legacy of Fatima Zahra. Peace and blessings be upon her, with Dr. Said Ammar Naqshawani. So far, we've discussed uh, Sayyidna the marriage of Fatima Zahra to Ali ibn Abi Talib, the hijrah, the relationship, how it built from start from the start. I want to ask something that affects us a lot in this day and age, and it's the honeymoon period. As in we spoke about the, the dowry and how much they spent. But the honeymoon, what did they do? Did they actually go on a honeymoon? Like, where did they go? What did they do for that? Well, their honeymoon is, is ironic um, in the sense that it may not be as luxurious or as comfortable as our mm. honeymoons. Their honeymoon was the Battle of Uhud. And uh, she had to treat um, many wounds on her husband's body. Because we know in that battle... The Qur'an is very clear about the difficult situation that the Muslims faced on that day Mm -hmm. to the extent that those who you had seen devotion from in Mecca were amongst those who ran away from the battle. The Qur'an mentions, for example, Muhammad and Rasulullah or the Quran mentions, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ The Quran mentions, Muhammad is but a messenger. Messengers have come before him. If he dies, or rather he is killed, 
you turn back on your heels. There were about 750 companions on the day of Uhud. And Fatima al-Zahra السلام, had accompanied the army as many other women did to try and either help giving water to soldiers or to help, for example, there were some nurses who were there mm. who could help medically. And there were even some who ended up fighting alongside the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, when the men ran away. And what's interesting is that the books of history mention clearly who ran away. And the books of history also mention clearly that there was only a few companions who remained loyal to the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, on the mountain of Uhud, mm. when Khalid ibn Walid, who on that day was amongst the opposition, had come from around the mountain to attack the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And there was a rumor that was going on in the, in the, in the middle of the ground that Mus'ab bin Umar, that the Prophet had died and it was Mus'ab bin Umar, but because they looked like each other, some people thought, you know what, that's it, it's the end of Islam. Others thought, let's get some of the spoils we missed out on in Badr. Mm -hmm. Now maybe let's get some in Uhud because it's not fair that we're in the mountain and these guys are all on the ground. And they left the Prophet alone. And were it not for the likes of, you know, Miqdad and Ammar bin Yasir, um, Abu Dujan al there's Ansari, only there's only a mm. few who remained loyal to the Prophet on that day. Mm. And amongst them was Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Now Imam Ali had just got married. Now in that first year of marriage, one thing you don't want is your husband coming home with blood everywhere. And another thing you may not want to do is serve your religion that much. You want to have it as a honeymoon period. Your attendances in the mosque might go a bit less. You know, there are certain people in the first, second year of their marriage. If you see them in Muharram, it's a blessing. You might see them on the night of Qadr. And other than that, the odd Thursday night. And, and what's wonderful about the Ahlul Bayt السلام, is that devotion constantly, mm. irrespective of marriage, no marriage, they are able to balance their life in the most profound way. And Imam Ali ibn Talib السلام, the plaudits that he receives on that day are immense when you hear the cry, La fata la Ali wa la sayfun illa dhul faqar. You're looking at that and you're recognizing that the heavens testify to his bravery. And his wife did not complain that why is it that we have to always do so much for Islam? Why can't we just have time for ourselves? You know, sometimes you'll have some wives, and in some cases, rightly so, where they may hardly ever get to spend time with their husbands or with their families. And they may be turning around and saying, when are we going to get time for ourselves? But Fatima Zahra said, no, on the contrary. When 4,000 of the opposition are attacking 750 of us, I'm proud when my husband serves the religion of God. So I wouldn't say it's a Maldives, uh, you know, holy, holy, uh, Hollywood resort, for example, somewhere in, in the West Coast or something. It really was a basic battle of Uhud and that probably cemented their love for a long time. Yeah. Now, before Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah alayhi, proposed to Fatima al-Zahra, some say that he had his eyes elsewhere. Abu Jahl's dua, for example, what would you say to this? No, not, not before. He was married to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Mm. And some say that he wanted, while married, he had his eyes on Abu Jahl's daughter by the name of Juwayriya. Now, if he is married to Fatima al-Zahra in, the, let's say, the second year after Hijrah, why, after the marriage of Fatima, why would you have your eyes on Abu Jahl's daughter of all people? You know there's a profound animosity between Ali ibn Abi Talib and Abu Jahl and some of the family members of Abu Jahl. Now why Imam Ali would want to go behind Fatima Zahra's back and, and go and propose for Abu Jahl's daughter? And when you look at the names of the people who narrate such a tradition, because you know how they relate this narration. They say that the hadith Fatima bad'atun minni man adaha faqad adhani they say that that's about Imam Ali, that he mm -hmm. angered Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, and she went and told Rasulullah, and Rasulullah made an announcement to everybody that I know you're all allowed four wives, but not Ali ibn Abi Talib. He can't do that to my daughter, and I'm not going to make halal was haram or haram was halal, but Ali ibn Abi Talib, sorry, I don't <coughs> accept this. It's not happening. It's so contradictory <laughs> that the Prophet now starts making laws for himself, for his daughter, um, makes a sudden announcement randomly, you know, and then says, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her, angers me, whoever angers me, angers Allah, Ali ibn Abi Talib has angered 
me today. Was that narration even said anywhere near that time period? Or Yeah, so what you have is that um, in the explanation of Fatima Bad'atun Minni, the tafsir of that is that Ali angers Fatima. Because sometimes people think, well, the tafsir is so blatantly obvious, but no, people have tried to push that to Imam Ali, alayhi salam, angering Fatima al Zahra. But you look at the likes of, you know, Al Karabis, Al Baghdadi, Maswar bin Makrama, people like that. We don't take narrations from these, either, you know, fil you know major hatred to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, in some cases known as Nawasib and so mm -hmm. on. Um, and so, yeah, the, you know, the Umayyads work their socks off to taint the image of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And one of them was to try and taint the image of his marriage. Yeah. Now, we've spoken about early years of Fatima Zahra, early years of Amir al Mu'mineen. There's one period in time where the Ahlul Bayt were brought together, and that is Mubahila. Is that the first dance where women represented Islam politically? Yeah, I think, I think the event of Mubahila really goes to show you that Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam is making a statement that a woman has as much role as any man in representing the religion of Islam in the public sphere. So, uh, in the political sphere, mm. in the social sphere. A woman has a major role to play and there are some communities where a woman is, you know, got no, could not have a word in edgeways. If she wants to come and, you know, be a representative politically for the religion, people are like, how could a woman go up there? She's compromising her hijab. That's not proper hijab. That's not proper etiquette. Then why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ When the Christians wanted to challenge the religion of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found it important that not just men go and represent this religion. Bring your woman, we'll bring our woman. Mm. It's sometimes our cultures that have prevented a woman from reaching. But I will say something very important here as well. Majority Muslim countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh have had woman lead. And there are bigger countries and wealthier countries than them who've never had a woman or a mm. female president in their history. No need to mention names. You look at Pakistan and Bangladesh, and you look at, for example, the likes of someone like, let's say, Benazir Bhutto, for example. You got a Muslim woman who are able to reach the top of her country and lead. Mm. And always the accusation is that you Muslims go give no right to women. And many of the movements for the rights of women were for women to vote and for women to be given more of a political presence. They're the same countries that advocate these. You'll find if you look at the list of their presidents, no woman. No one is female. In this country, you may have had a couple. You may, for example, Theresa May. You may, for example, have had Margaret Thatcher. And yet you look in the Muslim countries, there are a number of positions where Muslim women have either led mm. or been politically active. And the event of Mubahil is a testimony that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, wanted women to be politically involved mm. in the affairs of the community. After Mubahil, years after, or I'm not sure, when the death of the Prophet was after Mubahila, but that definitely brought so much pain to Fatima Zahra. But the way that's shown in Bukhari, it just shows a dispute between Fatima Zahra and Abu Bakr. It doesn't emphasize on the pain she went through with the, the coping with the death of her father. And it's, there's a narration here, if you don't mind, I'll read it out to you. Go ahead, go ahead. This is narrated by Aisha in uh, volume, five, volume 5, Book 59, number 546, Sahih Bukhari. Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet, sent someone to Abu Bakr when he was the Caliph, asking for in her inheritance of what Allah's Apostle had left of her property bestowed on him by Allah from the Fay, i.e. the beauty gained without fighting, in Medina and Fedek and what remained of the hummus of the Khaybar booty. On that, Abu Bakr said, Allah's Apostle said, our property is not inherited. Whatever we leave is sadaqah, but the family of the Prophet Muhammad can eat of this property. By Allah, I will not make any change in the state of the Sadaqah of Allah's Apostle and will leave it as it was during the, the lifetime of Allah's Apostle and will dispose of it as it is, Allah's, as it is 
that Allah's apostle used it to do so. So Abu Bakr refused to give anything of that to Fatima. Goes on, carries on to say, so she became angry with Abu Bakr and kept away from him and did not, uh, did not task him till she died. She remained alive for six months after the death of the Prophet, according to most of this narration. And when she died, her husband, Amir al-Mu'mineen, buried her at night without informing Abu Bakr. And he said the funeral prayer by himself. When Fatima was alive, the people used to respect Ali much. But after her death, Ali noticed a change in the people's attitude towards him. So Ali's allegiance... So Ali sought rec reconciliation with Abu Bakr and gave him an oath of allegiance. Ali had not given the oath of allegiance during those months, i.e. the period between the Prophet's death and Fatima's death. Ali sent someone to Abu Bakr saying, come to us. Yeah, I think um, it couldn't be more clearer than what Sahih al-Bukhari mm. uh, narrates that it's not my words that Fatima dies angry with Abu Bakr. It's narrated in the most famous work in the history of Islam for Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And um, one asks the question that when Fatima dies angry with someone, if we already take the hadith that says, Fatima is a part of me. Whoever angers her, angers me. And whoever angers me, angers Allah subhanahu mm. wa ta'ala. Then what is the position of Abu Bakr when this issue occurs? Now sometimes people ask us the Shia questions where they say that why do you have a difference of opinion, for example, with Abu Bakr or mm. with Omar and so on? <laughs> and if you were just to read Bukhari, then you have to reach your own conclusion. Mm. Fatwa Zara does not just get angry because of no reason. For her to be angry, there must have been an act that is committed that doesn't just displease her. It displeases the Prophet. It displeases the Prophet and goes against the tenets of the religion mm. of Islam. And this is proven by the fact that she doesn't want him at her funeral. And that the narration says she wants to be buried secretly. Mm. Now we know when a Muslim dies, you could be a hypocrite, you could be not religious, you don't come to the mosque. You come to that funeral prayer, you could come, you can recite Surah Al-Fatiha and go home. Mm. Why is it that she's adamant that he doesn't attend? That he doesn't attend, she doesn't want them to attend. Clearly no one can deny that as soon as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, dies, there is a major, major problem facing the religion of Islam between the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, and the first two caliphs. Mm. And as I said, Sahih al-Bukhari makes this clear, that she dies angry with the first caliph. Now, She's meant to have a, a bay'ah on her neck. Otherwise, she dies as a jahil. Does anyone have the audacity to say that the fact that she never gave bay'ah to the imam of her time, the khalifa of her time, do they have the audacity to say that Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, peace be upon his family, dies as a jahil? Or is it that the reality was that because of the incident of Ghadir and the announcement that Imam Ali السلام, is the successor of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, the most narrated tradition, mm. irrespective of how people debate the word Mawla, no one denies that the incident of Ghadir took place. It could be the case that, and it was the case that, Imam Ali was the Imam of her time. And on the issue of the land of Fedak, what's amazing is that Abu Bakr quotes the tradition where he says that prophets don't leave behind, um, they don't have you know, inheritors, rather what they leave behind is charity. Mm -hmm. And what I find amazing is that many prophets have already done this. You know, Sulaiman inherits Dawood, Yahya inherits Zakaria. And there is a general statement in chapter 2 verse 180 in the Quran that you already have to write a will if you leave certain mm -hmm. 
um, property behind. But what's fundamental about Fedak is Fedak is not inheritance. Fedak was given to Fatima Zahra in the seventh year after Hijrah. When the Jews of Khaybar were defeated, the distribution of Khums had taken place because a war had taken place. But if no war takes place in Islam, mm. no you know, cavalry fighting or horses and swords attacking each other. So it doesn't come under the category of Khums anymore, it comes under the category of Fay. Mm. And the Prophet distributes it as he pleases. And so Fedak doesn't come under inheritance. But if you're claiming it's inheritance, then she tells him Sulaiman inherited Dawood, Yahya inherited Zakaria. And the Quran mentions That's if he is claiming that it is inheritance. If he claims it's inheritance. However, she herself is first saying, number one, it's in my possession. Number two, Qa'idat al yad in Islamic law, possession indicates ownership. If I'm in possession of something, you come and say that that's not yours. I'm in its possession. You're the one who has to bring witnesses, not me. Mm. I'm living in the place. I have the place. You can't come and tell Fatima, you bring witnesses. Number three, there is a conversation, interesting conversation between Imam Ali السلام, and the first Khalifa. And he says to him, if someone told you that Fatima Zahra السلام, had committed adultery, what would you do? And he, would, he said, I would punish her. If the number of witnesses is the number that's required. Mm. He said, so you'd listen to the people's witnessing. And you go against Allah's witnessing? He said, what do you mean? He said, when Allah says, Allah has witnessed that they are pure. And you're listening to people who are saying that they would do something which is impure. So you'd listen to the witnessing of the people and you'd leave the witnessing of Allah? But, you know, at the end of the day, some of our brothers, some of our Sunni brothers, how do they look at this issue? Because it's interesting. Fatima dies angry with Abu Bakr, the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And some will say, well, you know what, these two are just, you know, fallible humans and you can make a mistake. Um, there isn't that real recognition of Fatima Zahra's status too much. You know, she's the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, you should respect her. But if she and Abu Bakr have a problem and she dies angry with Abu Bakr, no big deal, you know. Or even you'll have some who'll say, well, don't discuss it. And you have some who do the ta'wil of this in a phenomenal way. You know, there was one line that you mentioned where it says, um, it says that she didn't speak to him after this issue. And uh, a person tried to interpret this by saying, yes, yeah, she didn't speak to him about this issue after that day. <laughs> As if like, mashallah, they really were best friends mm. afterwards. I don't think they were. I think that um, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, and Abu Bakr, there was a clear problem, and Bukhari makes it clear. She dies, um, doesn't want anyone at her funeral, dies and is buried secretly in the night, having died angry with Abu Bakr and Omar. Yeah. Now, we say it's mentioned in Bukhari, and it's clear cut. But why is it hardly mentioned in the mosques, if it's clear cut in their books? Well, I think there is a general uh, message that's given to many of them from a young age um, that don't discuss that which may bring fitna or don't discuss periods of fitna, periods of dissension. You know, these that you should suspend judgment, um, especially on these sensitive issues. Abu Bakr versus Fatima, don't discuss. And if you do discuss, try and make it look rosy and glorious. Ali versus Aisha, find a random Jew somewhere and blame it on him. Muawiyah versus Ali, just say radiyallahu anha about both of them and hopefully Jannah will be graceful with these two together. And it's, it's just the general philosophy that you know what, it's, you're brought up having to admire certain people. When you see such traditions, you either discuss them or you just say, look, don't discuss these things. God is the best judge. Yeah. Now, Tabari sometimes, where he speaks of Umar threatening to burn the house of Fatima Zahra, what actually happened to the house of the Prophet? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Tabari, um, you know, there's, as you know, there's a Tabari who is from Ahlul Sunnah and there's a mm. Tabari who's from the Ahlushia. Shia. Um, from the Shia, the one who writes the Dala'il, um, contemporary of Tusi and Najashi um, in that Baghdad period. And you have from Ahlul Sunnah the renowned, um, the renowned author of the Tafsir and the Ta'rikh. And, and he mentions clearly that Umar ibn al-Khattab um, threatens to burn the house of Fatima mm. al-Zahra alayhi salam. 
Um, and I think, you know, at that moment, if someone threatens to burn the house of the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, and let's not just say daughter, someone who clearly the verse of the cloak was revealed about, mm. the verse of Mubahil is revealed about, she is the abundance of blessings that Allah gave. She's the mother of her father. She's a part of the Prophet. And he comes and threatens to burn the house. Well, normally you'll find people say, well, I don't take Tabari and Tabari is not a good muhaddith. And the fact is Tabari is showing there's no smoke without fire. Excuse the pun. Um, that, you know, literally there was a, a clear problem. And I don't think anyone can deny there's a problem between Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam, Abu Bakr and Omar. There clearly is a dislike uh, between all three of them um, and Omar yes and Tabari makes it clear that you know I'll burn the house um, and then it's up to the person to decide you know everyone's got their grave I can sit here all night and I could say well Tabari says this and he says this and if you want to revere and admire someone who threatens to burn the house of the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad as Tabari himself narrates and as others narrate quite interestingly you know Ibn Abi Shayba and the Musannaf. Um, Ibn Hajar has a discussion on it about narrators who give an indication that this has taken place. You know, Zahabi has an indication of the discussion. Mm. Baladari has a discussion on this issue. Um, dare I say, even going towards Ibn Taymiyyah and whether he justifies such an issue or no. He has a discussion on it. Look, there are certain people who say, well, Umar ibn al-Khattab's good deeds outweigh his bad deeds. And therefore, you can't make a judgment on him. There are others who say, if you threaten to burn the house of the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, then it's not someone who mm. you may necessarily take as a role model. Now, is there a Sahih chain in Shia literature to support this? Because I know, for example, we don't use, some don't use Salim ibn Qais because Ayatollah Khoui doesn't see him as a reliable source. There is... Um, a strong chain. We mentioned that there is a Tabari from Ahlul Sunnah and a Tabari from the Shia. Shia. And there is a particular chain that narrates how Qunfad, the servant of Umar, was the one who struck Fatima with the edge of his sword, which caused the broken rib and the miscarriage. And the chain is Abdullah, the son of Abi Najran, from Ibn Sinan, from Ibn Muskan from Abu Basir, from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. And you'll find that that is as strong chain as you're going to get talking about that incident. Now, why does Bukhari say she didn't want Abu Bakr at the funeral and she, was, she wanted to be buried in secret and at night? And is there a reason she doesn't want anyone to know where her grave is? I think she believes that what has taken place in Saqifa, and I think what took place with the confiscation of the land of Fadak, I think she's making a clear statement that she will never ever want to be associated with the principles of those who are behind those acts. Yeah. Now, the next question may be a hard one because we can't really express or describe the emotions of others. But can we sort of explain how Imam Ali must have felt at the loss of his wife? How did he deal with that time period? I think she explains her difficulty and he explains his difficulty. Mm. Now I'll narrate a line which we all narrate about her expressing the difficulties that she saw. صبت عليا مصائب لو أنها صبت على الأيام صرنا ليالي That truly the amount of you know trials that were, and tragedies that were poured upon her and if they were poured on the day it would become you know, darkness and night. And, and really, she herself expresses that the amount of tragedies that have befallen us. And then he himself, by her grave, there are lines attributed to him where he begins, of course, inna lillah wa inna alayhi raja'un. We are the servants of Allah and to Allah we will return. And then he says, how sad, O messenger of Allah, the green skies and the dusty earth have become to us. Mm -hmm. My sadness has become perpetual and my nights have become sleepless. The anxiety will not leave my heart until Allah chooses a dwelling for me next to you. My heart bleeds and my anxiety is restless. 
that separation was so sudden. She will meet you and she will explain to you the misfortunes that befell her and the injustices that were committed to her by your Ummah. Just look at Imam Ali ibn Talib's anguish here. The sadness has become perpetual. My nights have become sleepless. Mm. How much love does he have for this wife of his? A real lesson for all of us. When your wife has been loyal to you, your wife has been so soft-hearted, upright, principled with you, that should build a fervor and a passion and a love mm. between the two of you, a sakin and a rahman every way possible. He says, you know, my nights have become sleepless. And he mentions that there is an anxiety that affects him. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib, and you know, Ali ibn Abi Talib sees the height of spirituality. But even he is affected by the death of this lady. All of a sudden, you know, so young, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, so young and gone. And that famous line attributed to him, a flower came from heaven, went to heaven, mm. left its fragrance in my mind. Can you ever hear a line that beautiful what a powerful line. no one can ever describe his wife like the way the imam described his wife at that moment a flower came from heaven went to heaven left her fragrance in my mind and so it's a very difficult period for him firstly the loss of his beloved secondly he's now the father of orphans mm. and thirdly he's seen a period of difficulty and desertion by so many at that time I just want to remind the dear viewers that they can call in and direct their questions to the Sayyid. The number is 0203-515-0199. Now Sayyid, we spoke about the, live, the lives of the Ahlul Bayt. Alayhim. Let's bring it back to today. A few days ago was World Hijab Day. How do we implement the real Hijab of Fatima al Zahra? In this day and age and in this sort of region of the world where it differs in the east how do we take it and apply it here without crossing any boundaries you see hijab does not mean head covering mm. head covering is part of the package head covering in arabic is khimar quran says let them draw their veils over their bosoms. Many times in our community, if a girl doesn't cover her head, we say she doesn't wear hijab. No, we should say she doesn't wear the khimar. Mm. Because sometimes someone will say, I'm looking for the word for, for covering the head in the Quran. They're looking for hijab. You're looking for the wrong word. The Arabs who used to cover their head did not say, I'm covering my head with a hijab. They used to say, I'm covering my head with a khimar. khimar. That's why if you ask many, ask an Iraqi, for example, now, what's alcohol? <laughs> In Arabic, what will he say to you? Khamur. Khamur. Why Khamur? Khamur is associated with that. Khamur is just a covering. Mm. Because alcohol is seen as something that covers your reasoning, it was associated with Khamur. Khamur. Khamar is just the head covering. So when someone says to me, for example, how can I observe the hijab of Fatima? Some assume that the word hijab means head covering. No, Khamar is the head covering. Hijab is the, the full package. The package of social and physical mm. modesty to be observed by the male and the female is hijab. And too many times when I hear people saying, you know what, um, her, her hijab is not great. And you're like, what do you mean hijab is not great? Oh, you know, she's not covering her head properly. Then you should say her khimar is not great. Because part of, the cover, part of the hijab is head covering. Part of it is social and akhlaq mm. and being soft-hearted and not being rude. There are many girls out there who don't wear hijab in the sense of head covering, the khimar. Mm. But they wear the hijab of akhlaq. Of course. They wear the hijab of being soft-hearted or being respectful. But they haven't, for example, covered their head. Would, sorry to cut you off. Would you say one is more important than the other? No, you know, you know sometimes... The, there are sisters out there who don't cover their head. They're like, have you seen the ones who cover their hair? They're all hypocrites. They're not all hypocrites. I'm sure there's a couple of good ones. Mm. And then you have the ones who do cover their hair. And they'll judge the ones out there who don't cover their hair. Look, she doesn't cover her hair. Well, she may have better akhlaq than mm. you. Not as judgmental as you. So I think what the Ahlul Bayt of Allah show us is, you know what? 
wearing the khimar doesn't stop me at mubahala. Wearing the khimar doesn't stop me giving my famous mm -hmm. sermon fadakiya, al khutbah al fadakiya. Wearing the khimar doesn't stop me speaking out against the injustices of my time, or being a good wife, or being an educated mother. And that should be a message for all because some of our sisters today may be thinking, should I take off my khimar? Maybe I get more attention, maybe I get less attention. More attention from people who might want to get married, less attention from those who might be Islamophobic. Mm. But Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, I think she shows us, you know what, you could be politically active, as she showed with Fedak, you can be active in the world of intra-faith, as she showed with Mubahala, you could be active in terms of building a wonderful family, as she had with her four kids. Mm. You know, so I think hijab shouldn't be just confined to what we conceive of in the world of clothing, but rather what can be achieved spiritually and socially by the human being, irrespective of their gender. Asantum said, we have one question, we only have time for one question from our viewers. The question is slightly off topic. How does Sayyida Zainab sallallahu alayha relive the legacy of Fatima Zahra in Karbala? How does she take it to Karbala? Well, I think first and foremost, she, she is a reflection of her mother and she builds a wonderful family mm. with her husband, Abdullah, the son of Jafar. And I think, um, you know, secondly, she's ready to be politically outspoken against the arrogant Ibn Ziyad and Yazids of the world. Her hijab doesn't stop her mm. from being politically outspoken. Um, thirdly, she is only angry for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of herself. Mm. Uh, constantly with Yazid, when she destroys them in her sermon and sham, you know, she, she makes it clear that, you know what, um, don't count those who have died in the way of Allah has been dead. They're alive. You know, we, we haven't lost this. However hard you try, you'll never remove our love from the hearts of the mm. people. There's that real strength and conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like her mother Fatima, that, you know, I know that what I'm going to say is going to cause trouble. It's going to lead to my death. I'm the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. But I'm going to die at such a young age that until today, no Muslim knows where the grave mm. of Fatima Zahra is. The only lady in Islamic history in that period, we haven't got a clue where she's buried because of the oppression of the time. Um, and so Sayyidina Zainab alayhi salam, many wonderful lessons from her mother, even though she died at the same age as Fatima had um, been when her mother Khadija died. So it was, you could say, the ultimate sacrifice. That even She was even oppressed in her death as well as her life, Fatima Zahra. Well, I, th I think, you know, um, I, we see it as oppression. She definitely is saddened by their action, mm. but saddened because the religion of Islam was being ripped into pieces. Mm. Yeah. Hassanatum Sayyidina, uh, again, every time we have you on the show, we have a fruitful discussion about the Ahl al-Bayt, about lessons we can apply to our lives. Thank you. Uh, Inshallah, we will be joined again by Dr. Said Amar Naqshawani on Monday. We will continue on more fruitful discussions on the Ahl al-Bayt, inshallah. So tune in on Monday, 9 p.m. GMT time. But for now, we'd like to say, for me and the Sayyid and the whole team, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.